right, here we are, episode two of Cranked and Ranked. Uh, thank you all for joining. Uh, if this is your first time, uh, this is a podcast where me and a friend of mine, we basically rank uh, an artist catalog or some other sort of ranking thing we come up with, and we have a pretty deep discussion about whatever subject it is we're talking about. So it's just kind of a, a back and forth here. Um, so you've got me. My name is Steven. I uh, have a YouTube channel called Old Head and a podcast which is on this same podcast channel, but it, it is also called Old Head, talking about rock and metal and the and whatnot. And uh, my good friend, uh, Mr. Eddie Sparks, he also has a YouTube channel uh, where he does rock and metal related videos and other sort of, it seems more comedy. I'll, I'll let you talk for a second. <laughs> Uh, I, yeah, I, I suppose my, I, I kind of took a more, uh, meme, uh, kind of format with mine. Mine is, mine's a little more, uh, faster tempo, bam, bam, bam. Whereas what I like about Steve with old head is that it gives me a moment to just sit back and have a nicer, just talky kind of video <laughs> instead of my, Ba, 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 kind of thing going on. I usually use like a green screen and stuff and I throw in a lot of wacky editing. But uh, yeah, as of recently, I haven't got my green screen, unfortunately. It's at my grandparents' house. And with the COVID thing, I didn't want to cause anything like that. So at the minute, my videos are a little more stripped back, but they still have that kind of wacky atmosphere a little bit. But yeah, that is, that is me. I am cool. Eddie Sparks. Cool, yeah. <laughs> and you can go so go if you're listening to this on a podcast, go to YouTube, look up Eddie Sparks, look up Old Head Podcasts, and go and look at our shit. Um, so I'm gonna wrap I'm gonna wrap up our introduction pretty quick because I figure after the second episode we can dispense with the the introductions. If you don't already know us, you should have been listening since the beginning. But uh, Eddie <laughs> Eddie is uh, is 22. I am 42. We you know generations apart. He's from the UK. I'm from the US. We're taking our different perspectives on this music, and basically that's what. It's making this uh, interesting for you, the listener. So today, uh, we're going to tackle another uh, pretty big band. Uh, last time on the first episode, we tackled Nirvana. So we decided to go to the complete opposite end of the rock and roll spectrum. And we're going to be talking about the classic uh, glam, hard rock, heavy band. I don't, they, they, I don't know exactly what to classify them as. I guess some people would just say hair metal. Uh, but uh, we're going to be talking about the discography of Motley Crue. Uh, ranking all their albums for better for worse <laughs> but uh so let's <laughs> let's uh, jump right into it well, i guess as we did last time we talked about where we came in on the motley crew story um as fans and i honestly didn't become a motley crew fan until dr feel good came out in 1989 that was the yeah. first time that i really started listening to them prior to that i remember seeing the video for too young to fall in love when there's like, they're doing like karate shit in it. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think I, I'm probably saw smoking in the boys room and stuff like that on MTV, but none of it really like clicked with me until I heard the song, Dr. Feel Good. And so that's when I came into the thing and I've kind of been a fan of them ever since. How about you, sir? Again, just like last time, kind of showing my age here. Uh, I got, I got on the Motley Crue train a little later into my, you know, being a rock fan and stuff. But um, the first ever, the first two Motley Crue songs I ever heard were Looks That Kill from the Guitar Hero 5 soundtrack <laughs> and Too Young to Fall in Love, which is on the Grand Theft Auto Vice City soundtrack. So I had a much more, you know, uh, modern day introduction than perhaps maybe like seeing the videos on MTV or reading them in magazines. I just, I just kind of discovered them through finding out, Oh wow, this is what the eighties sounded like. This is fucking rad. You know, I was, I was, um, there's a little story that I'll get into later in, in the podcast, but, um, yeah. When I elaborate on one of the songs. Cool. I, yeah, I, th this, I think uh, it's, I think it's very important to point out the importance of uh, video games for newer fans of music. And I know yeah. a lot of a lot of older folks like to shit on, 
you know, video games, like whatever, you know, what, you know, back in the day, we went to the record store or whatever. But really, if you're talking about my generation, those same old people would talk shit because we were watching MTV. So it's the same fucking yeah. thing. We were getting our music from the television um, and you are, it's the same thing for you, only it's through a video yeah. game. And so I don't care how people come in contact with music as long as you do. So um, yeah. I think that that's a, a thing to be pointed out. The video game, video games are very important for turning on people to new music. And that's why, that's why I was always kind of skeptical of the hate that bands that, sorry, that, um, games like rock band and guitar hero got because i just i thought to myself you know a lot of the people that i knew who played these games went on to become musicians so um you know i actually figured out that i was better at the drums than i am guitar by playing guitar hero and i realized wow i've got a real knack for the drums on this thing maybe i should give that a go and then yeah. Lo, lo and behold, I get I get a drum kit, and I discovered something new about myself that I might not have had I not played the game. Yeah, I so think we um, I think we've pretty much reached the point in in a, in a particular generation where you're going to start seeing bands come out, and when they ask them where they started, they're going to say rock band or guitar hero or something like yeah. that. Um, so yeah, I mean, if I had had that shit back in the day, I would have been all over it too, and that could have very well been my beginning. Um, but okay, let's, so since we don't take up a bunch of time or so we don't, uh, let's jump, <laughs> let's jump right into ranking. So we're doing nine, nine studio albums, uh, for a uh, Motley Crue. And so, uh, as usual, I, sir, I'm going to let you go first. What is your number nine? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and say this with, when we rank our, um, albums and stuff, we may not necessarily mean that the one at the bottom is the worst as in bad, but in this case, the one at the bottom is bad. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I'm going to kick this off uh, right off the bat. And I, from what I've seen as well, I, I think I'm pretty, pretty on it with the general consensus, really. It's uh, got to go with Generation Swine. Oh, it's, okay. Yeah, I, I like. Sorry to the to the people that do like this album, but I love Crew. But I'm going in on this record because a, it's entertaining to take the piss out of something, and b, good lord, did this one fucking drain me while I listened to it. <laughs> like it. It's it's not only the fact that it's bad. It like barely even sounds like Motley Crue. It, and it to me it feels like a tacky forced attempt at trying to be contemporary, and it, it they kind of attempted to come back as, as this like post grunge band. You know, I know Vince is back now, but like in in that era, but like he can't seem to save the music because this is really just jumping on the post grunge bandwagon it's like they listened to the foo fighters and said oh hey let's throw in a little bit of industrial and that's our new sound but like it just it just doesn't just really doesn't land for, for me especially okay. you know i was this was the one album in this entire ranking where i could confidently say I am bored <laughs> of what's going on. You know, it to me, it, I could barely even do it in one sitting. I actually had to I actually had to take a break cuz there's way too much experimenting. Generally, I'm a fan of adding new dimensions to the music, but this is when it goes way too far. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, Motley Crue is not a fucking post-grunge band. Like in contrast, in contrast to the heavier sound they explored on their 94 self-titled um, album with John Karabi, this isn't even like metal really. Like the rest of the the rest of the albums like are, you know, the glam hair metal kind of thing with the exception of that one being more hard rock heavy metal. But 
like the first track find myself it, it it starts promisingly with this like groove riff and i was like oh maybe this is this is better than i better than i thought but then it jumps into this trying to be an alternative band kind of thing that just feels so out of left field it's it's completely out of the blue and I will say the line I'm a dick got a good laugh out of me though <laughs> but like and I'm saving that one for the for the edit bank when I uh, make another video on Motley Crue maybe maybe in context with maybe Vince doing something shady yeah he's he's done a few of those but um <laughs> But yeah, it, it, just moving on through the track list, you know, Afraid, it feels like the band heard Foo Fighters and a little bit of Ministry and said, let's do that. Track three, Flush, is what someone needs to do with this album. <laughs> <laughs> you know, track three and I'm already bored. You know, it's a meandering five minutes of like not really going anywhere. I kind of, I was thinking, you know, what the hell happened in 1997 for this to have been made? You know, it's Generation Swine, the title track, another song I I barely got through. I, I honestly had to remind myself that this was the crew at points because this record is just so fucking weird. And usually I can appreciate weird albums, especially stuff like, you know, Mr. Bungle jumping around with different genres and stuff. But this is precisely how not to do it. Like, they might as well have just changed their name because... This really isn't the same band. Like the fact that the band without Vince Neil sounded more like Motley Crue than this album does, to me at least, is like I sound so fucking harsh on this one. I've never, I, <laughs> yeah. like, I've, I've never ripped an album to shreds like this before. That's but, all right. We had a total love fest on the last podcast, yeah. so we need to have a juxtaposition <laughs> here. <laughs> But yeah, like I was, like I was saying, I might I might sound harsh, but the '90s were not kind to glam bands. But this, like this album, is a legitimate '80s renowned metal band from the '80s making the most generic '90s rock they possibly can. And like by the fifth track, Confessions, I was yawning just about every four bars. Like a lot of these songs could have been way shorter. Beauty tries to sound like a pop rock Nine Inch Nails and falls flat on its face. Like listening to this after Theater of Pain, uh, I didn't. I didn't listen to the albums in sequence. I went at them randomly so I could, um, so I wouldn't get too attached to one era. So I thought I'll do one of their eighties. I'll do a newer one. I'll do and jump back between the two. But good lord, like Theater of Pain. <laughs> D theater of pain is supposed to be a messy album i dare anyone to listen to this album and try and fucking hold a candle to how much of a mess theater of pain must be compared to this fucking thing yeah you know <laughs> like this this album honestly is is 50 minutes of of what is happening you know by this point i could i had completely zoned out i had completely tuned out and then glitter starts, and you know what's, you, you know what you know what's fucked up. This is the most Motley Crue sounding song yet to my ears, and it sounds fuck all like Motley Crue. <laughs> and it's it could be just the synths conjuring up a little bit of uh, what what the synths are doing. They're conjuring up a little bit of home sweet home energy, but yeah. Again, anybody out there tries to bring the energy back up, but just really misses the mark once again. Let us pray. I will. I will give this album one redeeming quality. The song "Let Us Pray" is the only redeeming song. Its groove is reminiscent of the previous album, and I will admit Vince's scream work on here sounds gnarly as all hell. Certainly not a go-to Motley track, but this does stand out like a gemstone in a river of shit. <laughs> <And> <laughs> but it, it, that was the one track where I actually thought, 
maybe side B is completely different. Maybe it's maybe it really picks up after here. But you know, I this is where I get into the. I got a little nicer with my notes. You know, Rocket Ship is a short little ballad. Nikki wrote for his wife which you know has the decency to be a shorter track unlike some of the songs on here um a rat like me is another boring meandering trying to be post grunge song there's there's not really anything to say on this song that i haven't said before and and i think that speaks volumes um the next one i want to preface with the following statement i don't like it when bands re-record their songs. Amen. I fucking don't... I don't get it, you know? And the worst part is they changed the riff in um, Shout of the Devil. And to me, why make a worse song of a song that people already know and love? And I think this is the version that they would go on to play from here on in of shout of the devil and i feel a little bit like like i know uh (laughs) it really it it really does dumbfound me this record it really does because all of the decisions made on this just have one response it's like what the fuck (laughs) Fair, fair enough and like the last last track on the album um, Brandon yeah. closes the album with you know a little bit of a touching nod to Tommy Lee's son of the same name. I don't want to shit on such a sincere song, really. You know, this is actually a nice song. The lyrics are a little on the nose. You're my son. I love you. <laughs> so, but like, but you know, Tommy actually has a pretty good singing voice. You know, and. I gotta, I gotta say, I, I almost shed a tear solely based on the fact that during this emotional moment on the album, I realized I never have to listen to this ever again. <laughs> <laughs> and all in all, in all, uh, this is uh, the third of this list. Uh, considering there are like one, two, maybe three good-ish songs on this out of 13. I would go so far as to say that the album without Vince Neil is more essential than this, which says a lot considering how much, like, shit that album unfairly receives yeah. for being too for being too grungy. And there, now I've sufficiently destroyed Generation Swine... <laughs> Yeah, shit, man. I'm I'm gonna <laughs> hand it over to you. I, that was that was kind of brutal. I'm cool. sorry. <laughs> yeah, and 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 it's very funny coming off of that, and you're like, this is such a piece of shit, and I'm all like, that is not my number nine album. <laughs> <laughs> my my number I'm intri- nine. I'm intrigued. Album, it, my number nine album is New Tattoo from the year two thousand. Really. Um. So. Uh. I don't have a lot to say about this album because I feel about New Tattoo the way that you feel about Generation Swine, where I can barely get through it. I when it, if I normally am listening to it, I'll skip tracks. Or yeah, it, it, I don't make it all the way through songs. So with New Tattoo, obviously it's the only album that doesn't have Tommy Lee on drums, but it is Randy Castillo, and that dude was a fucking great drummer. So yeah. So that's fine, but he doesn't have the character that Tommy Lee did. Like Tommy Lee is one of those drummers that has his own thing going all the time. And that's pretty great. So that's missing, obviously. Um, So my biggest gripe with this album is the same gripe that I'll have with one other album um, that I'll get to. And that's that there's a co-writer on many of the songs who was also or is also in the band 6AM with Nikki Six. And yeah. almost every song I hear that's got this, I can't remember his name, but every song that his name is on is shit. Like it's, 
It is like <laughs> rock music written by somebody who doesn't really understand rock music. So they have a template and they're just like, I feel like this is what rock and roll sounds like. And that, and so the riffs are all really regurgitated from other shit you've already heard a million times. And lyrically, and I, I don't, I, I, I could probably point the blame at Vince Neil too, but I don't, but I think Nikki Six does a lot of, of lyric writing, but the, I don't know the, so the, 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 it's just forgettable song after forgettable song. And it really just does feel like if you look at the track, I had, I had the, I had it pulled up here to look at the track listing, like, like track names, treat me like the dog. I am uh first band on the moon punched in the teeth by love. And then of course you have like (laughs) Hollywood ending fake porno star it's almost like the band wrote down song titles and then handed them to somebody and said here can you write songs to fit these song titles thank you and i I can see that yeah and it just so it's just the the there it's just so uninspired and and i'm going to piggyback off of what you were talking about with generation swine because this is this was the album following that this to me feels like a band backpedaling a lot And that to me feels, that feels less genuine than a band that just is being surrounded by all this different music that they were probably listening to. And they were trying to incorporate all of these other things into their music. Like, even though you could say it, they tried too hard to incorporate, you know, industrial elements or grunge elements or whatever, that's the shit that was going on. And so it feels more natural than, oh, shit, uh, we got to write something that sounds like Motley Crue. Can anybody help us? <laughs> you know, and so yeah, <laughs> um, it, it just doesn't feel genuine. And I, the, the one thing that I wrote down with my notes that I think sums it all up is that New Tattoo is the rock and roll album equivalent of a shrug. Like, it's just like, yeah. okay, here you go. Yeah. Here's, a, here's an album. Um, and so... Yeah, w- without digging into particular songs, because, you know, especially the title track, New Tattoo, holy shit, that's bad. But yeah. um, it's just a lot of things that it's, I don't know, if you want a Motley Crue album and this is the only one you got, it's fine, but that's it. It's literally, it, mm. it, it, it survives only on the fact that three-fourths of Motley Crue play on it. Like, that's absolutely it. Um, yeah. and so it's, it's, uh, it's very boring. So there you go. My, my nine is new tattoo. Well, that's, that's a good segue because my number eight is new tattoo. <laughs> and, uh, I gotta say, you know, a lot of the things you said there are things I would definitely criticize it for. I think I got through this one solely based on the fact that it did sound it had it like you say it was very cookie cutter but it was still that kind of rock and roll kind of approach um i would say you know it's it, to me personally i find it better than generation swine to to listen to but it pales in comparison to their 80s work it's um yeah you know it's the first um it i would say it's the most motley crew album since dr feel good with regards to trying to get that kind of 80s ish thing back into their sound and to me like the the instrumentation and the production and how the songs are written um it does sound like the prototype for the sound that steel panther would go on to adopt because it's got like that modern take on the glam thing. Even though I like I like Steel Panther, I agree with a lot of the things you say here. But it's I think that they also tried to pander a little bit to the newer generation because a lot of these songs also have a little sprinkling of pop punk influence. I find yeah, there it's just for that added high school appeal. And bearing in mind this was released in 2001 when that kind of thing was was really kicking off you know that the new metal thing was in its like second phase and on its way out and the pop punk thing started to kind of 
coincide, I suppose. Yeah, you know, I'm not a I'm not an expert on the late nineties and early noughties, but yeah, I, I do I'm, I'm, I do feel that Nikki Six in general is a person. He seems like somebody who pays very close attention to what's going on in music at the time. Yeah. And so, so sometimes I think that's that's a good quality with him, and sometimes I think it's not a good quality with him. Yeah, it, it can it can come across as a little bit like, oh, um, hey, fellow kids, <laughs> <laughs> like, like like that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, I would say you know I, I'm kind of guilty of doing track by track notes, but. Um, I think I that's say, fine because I don't, so I feel like it evens it out. You you talk about yeah. specific tracks. I'm more of a feeling and summary kind of guy, so I feel like this works. Sounds good. Yeah, I I just I didn't want it to come off like too in in depth. Is all I did. I didn't want to sound like too much of a nerd. <laughs> no, nobody's telling us to be quick with these podcasts, so you know. Let's oh just do God, it. hell yeah! <laughs> oh, I'm going in. Going in. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, hell on high heels. Starts the album with a modern take on the glam sound, like I say, very much like the sound Steel Panther would adopt. Uh, Treat Me Like the Dog I Am. It's more punky, but retaining that modern glam-ish sound. New Tattoo, title track. Am Am I crazy for thinking this is one of the few times where a band named the song, and named the album, sorry, after the ballad, could usually... (laughs) Like yeah. I, normally, a, a band would name the album after like the Balls Out Ripper song, but like yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just something. It was one of those strange little things I picked up on. I, I was can't like, think oh. of another one. Yeah, I was thinking like, oh, new tattoo. The title track must be a must be a Balls Out rocker, and then and then it's this like laid back acoustic ballad, and I'm thinking, has to my knowledge, has that been done? So that made me think a little bit, but yeah, like you were saying, like a lot of these song titles are are like they're like a kid kind of wrote out what he thinks a rock star is. Yeah, you know, it's it's that very you know, it's almost kind of like preschool, like drag drag strip superstar. That's almost <laughs> like that's that's also that's almost like something a kid calls himself in a racing game when he plays it when he's a kid. Yeah. It's like, yeah. But it's like, it does pick up the pace a little bit. First band on the moon is, is a bit of fun. All the conventions of the party metal thing are here. It's upbeat with the standard glam metal lyrics about shagging and partying and breaking rules and stuff. You know, I'm, I'm not expecting lyrical depth from hair metal. Like hair metal is renowned for being that kind of forget all your problems, just take crack. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so, yeah, she needs rock and roll is what I would consider the stripper song of the album. You know, those, those like kind of pour some sugar on me kind of grooves. Those, they always use them in like TV and movies for those kind of scenes. They always have that down elk kind of, yeah, I don't know if that's something I've picked up on myself just throughout <laughs> the years, but I've always I've always called like groovy, um, yeah, groovy glam riffs, stripper riffs for some reason, and it, it's something I've never been able to let go of. <laughs> I mean, you're not um, off the mark at all with that. Yeah, uh, it's, it's like it's like punched in the teeth by love, like you were saying. This is this is like. Do you know that song by Steel Panther, Fucking My Heart in the Ass? Like I, I, this, I, I don't know any songs by Steel Panther. Ah, uh, well they I <laughs> I honestly honest, yeah. <laughs> I I honestly think that that Steel Panther songs is a parody of the, the title at least, you know, that punched in the teeth by love, you know, it's, that's all that's on a par with the whole fucking my heart in the ass thing because it's just it's quite nonsensical, but it's also trying to be cool. Just, so, <laughs> just a quick aside, since we since you mentioned that band, <laughs> I I I've only heard random things, random songs by them. I don't. I've never dove into their stuff, and it's mostly because around the time you started seeing Steel Panther stuff coming out, that was literally when there had been years of me trying to defend music from the eighties. 
from <laughs> shit like this. So these motherfuckers come out and they're just like, oh, you people that are actually fans of this shit, we're going to make it harder for you to have people take you seriously because we're going to shit all over it making these dumbass songs. And so that's, that's, that's how I feel about any sort of comedy band or a band yeah. that, or a band that tries to be too funny with a style of music that doesn't need anyone to be funny with it. Like you can already laugh at elements of, of eighties hard rock and hair metal. So it's almost yeah. like the easiest joke possible over and over again on an album. And so I've just said, you know what, if you enjoy steel Panther, just keep it over there. <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> I, I'm over here. I don't need you know, shit to be that on the nose with my comedy. Fair enough. Yeah, I, I would I would say that the combination of of playing Vice City and um listening to Steel Panther was was kind of my kind of my gateway into glam. But that's me that's me speaking from a from a twelve year old standpoint. Yeah. So, you know I was like, tit jokes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, anyway, like just going back to the whole punch in the teeth by love, it's it's a A C D C esque kind of chugger it has my favorite riff so far in the album and it does have pretty cool gang vocals i do feel like this is the one song that could have perhaps been on shout of the devil but that's a, a stretch with this album um hollywood ending you know another ballad i think they they space the ballads out nicely on the album uh it's a bit rockier than the title track i i do like the uh bridge section with the sitar part i did think that was pretty cool i guess you got to give them some credit for throwing in some ballads in there i guess at the time because yeah. that seemed very not cool at the time so yeah that that was that was one of the big things that you know the those kind of bands were ripped on for years after as well you know are oh, you oh, you wrote a ballad sell out you know, <laughs> which is essentially kind of, the equivalent of saying you have a variety of songs on your album. That's fucking lame. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's it, that whole. I I suppose I never really I never lived through um, the eighties, but like I was kind of raised on it. So I heard all of these songs, and I was like, oh, this is just a slow eighties song. But I I can imagine it being frustrating during the late 80s and early 90s to just be inundated with power ballad after power ballad because it, it did become a big marketing ploy as well. Yeah, but I think I, that I think that it it unnecessarily gets flack because if you go back yeah. and the thing that was I think people started to catch on was that a band would put out an album, you would get uh song number 1 Single number one, which was an upbeat track. Single number two was usually the ballad. But if you go back and listen to a lot of these, those were really well-written songs. There's a they reason were. why they were hits. And so, you know, as much as like, I don't know, take a band like Cinderella, which I'm sure we'll get to, but, you yeah. know, the <laughs> when, when Long Cold Winter came out, I, you know, as much as I love Gypsy Road, great fucking song, but Don't Know What You Got Till It's Gone is a, a flat out amazingly well written song. Um, awesome and so, song. And so, of course, they became hits. So, if so, some bands did phone it in with their, with their ballads, mm. but I think the ones that have stood the test of time that you would see on like the Monster Ballads collection, I think yeah. those are genuinely fucking good songs. So, screw those people. I, I you know, yeah. I got room for some soft shit in my heart, you know? <laughs> I think we all do deep down. It's it's that whole like macho I'm I'm not allowed to like anything slower than 200 BPM because <laughs> I'm fucking thrash and anything other than fast is poser. Like, you know, I think a lot of those those kind of mindsets I don't think they're nearly as common today, you know, especially seeing as like slower metal is much more favored now in the mainstream with yeah. like you know the the rise of the breakdown that really like you know you had the beginnings of it with pantera in the 90s changing the focus from like speed to groove but it just got it's gotten to the point now where it's like the coolest thing in the world is playing one note a minute <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately yeah, and it's it's just like it's completely flip flop to the other side of the spectrum. 
But yeah, where where was I? That was that was a little tangent there. Uh, um, punched in the teeth by love. I think you were after that. I think is where you were. Hollywood ending. Ah, yeah. fake. Fake is the fake. one we're on now. Uh, the closest thing to something on the next album, because it sounds very much like something that could have been on Saints of L.A., Saints of Los Angeles, um, just solely based on its like modern hard rock sound. Uh, Porno Star is another pop punky one, you know, complete with na 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 parts in it. You tell yeah. me that. You tell me that wasn't some Blink One Eighty Two shit going on in there. Um, it's it's just it's just glam metal enough to be okay, <laughs> but it's still in there. Um, white punks on dope again with these titles, you know, <laughs> it's like you said, it's like yes, you are, <laughs> and it, and God, it it closes out the record with some good time rock and roll glam that Motley were known for, you know, breaking out every now and again. You know, but overall, this album feels like the band trying to hit the balance between winning back their fans from the 80s while bringing in a new generation. Yeah, I think to an extent, it's an admirable effort, but it can't compare to their 80s work. And since and since you raised the uh, issue of it, of it being a bit disingenuous i i didn't really think about that at the time but now you're now you've mentioned it you know well I've, if you're if you're bringing on the the comparison to pop punk it makes a little bit more sense but pop punk is such a stripped down basic form of rock music that it it yeah. does it's easy to to let it just wash over you and and feel like it's nothing you know it's that's why a lot yeah. of those a lot of those bands from that era, you know, aside from a few, like you don't really hear people talk about them anymore because yeah. it's just music that existed at the time but didn't last because it's so just whatever, you know, in its approach. All right, well then let's move on, I guess. So that so that was your number 8. My number 8 is uh Saints of Los Angeles from 2008. Wow. Um, num- number one thing that I'm going to have to say, because I said it for new tattoo, uh, home dude from 6am all over this fucking album. And it shows yeah. it shows. <laughs> um, so if, if I really wanted to just sum up this album to somebody that wanted to know why I don't like it that much, it's because it sounds like if you were watching a movie and in the movie, there was a fake band that was kind of supposed to be like Motley Crue and they wrote songs for this fake band in the movie. This is what the songs would sound like where it's not Motley Crue. It's like trying to emulate Motley Crue and make these songs that are the same thing with new tattoo. They're just trying too hard to fit into some exact thing. It doesn't sound inspired. It sounds like it was a homework project um, and on top of that, the overall feeling of the album to me, when I, the, it, when I listened to it, when it came out and when I listened to it today, sure, it's enjoyable. The thing I, I can say about all of these albums, even the ones I don't like much is that it still is a good time. So if you're hanging out, you know, drinking with your buddies and these albums are playing in the background, it's not going to take away from anything. They're, they're enjoyable in their own way. But Saints of Los Angeles sounds to me like a rock and roll album written and made for older people who no longer listen to rock and roll music. So they needed a reminder of what rock and roll music is. So all these older people who are now much more interested in sports or or whatever the fuck they're interested in, but they used to be into music a lot back in the day, and they say things like that. I remember back when I was really into music. And so they hear this, and it's like just enough rock, but not going overboard. Just enough to Mm -hmm. where it's like, no, don't don't scare you know, the older people just make it just (laughs) enough rock and roll to where it doesn't offend anybody. Um, and then it's like, there's a lot of peppering in things to make it seem extreme, I guess, with subject matter and with certain words and phrases and explicit language and just shit thrown in just to make it seem like something. And, um, 
I, I'm going to pause here for a second, though, because out, out of all of my griping about this album, the song Saints of Los Angeles is a fucking banger. Like, that is yeah. a great song that I think stands up with their 80s stuff. It's really mm. good. So I almost feel like maybe they somehow wrote that song and it was so good. They're like, shit, we got to fucking throw an album around this amazing song. And then the rest of it took a lot less time and, and yeah. effort to put together. It's just, it, the songwriting's just kind of lazy. Um, and it, it's one of those things where it just, it, it, you, I'm struggling to get through it. And by the second half, the songs get worse. And so it gets harder to listen to as it goes on. And so overall, it's just one of those things where if you wanted a Motley Crue album, here you go. But it, there's nothing, there's nothing dangerous about it. It, it, Motley Crue, even though they get lumped in with these pretty boy kind of bands, they always seem like dudes that were on the verge of killing each other or themselves And now it's just like, we're going to make an album talking about back when we used to be a really great band. Yeah. And that's how the music sounds too. But I I really do think that because I've heard some 6am and I've never really been into it. I really do think that that guy co-writing stuff, I think he takes a little bit of the, of the aggression and wind out of their sails. Cause maybe they don't feel so, uh, uh, attached to it because they're not doing all the work themselves. You know, mm. oh, that dude's name is on it or whatever. And I don't know that guy and I don't want to talk shit about him. I'm sure he's great, but um, that that's the, that's the weak link. That is the li- link between saints and new tattoo is that that guy is a co-writer and they're both the two worst Motley Crue albums in my opinion. So um, yeah, that's basically it. It's just, it's just as a Motley Crue album, it's kind of a letdown overall. I can see that, like, and this works perfectly because my number seven is Saints of Los Angeles. Hey. This this, ep- this episode's running real smooth. I like <laughs> this. Um, but yeah, the it's the last full studio album we got out of the band, and this whole album does feel like an homage to their eighties work through a modern lens, and very often it it can. It can come across as like, ah, oh, remember that time we were dot dot dot, you know that kind of. A lot of these songs have that, um, but yeah, just going into a, a track by track. Uh, Face down in the dirt, I thought was a was a good opener. You know, it 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 does open like um, an homage to Shout at the Devil with that like kind of introy bit. Yeah. Um, and then you've got Face Down in the Dirt. I, I think I do detect some um, serious vocal processing on, on Vince oh, on everywhere. this album. Everywhere yeah. on that album. Yeah, it's, it sounds too clean in places. Um, I, th- I felt like in, in, the, in the verses, it was channeling a little bit of Joan Jett. But... Aside from that, you know, it's it is like you say, it's 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 quite sterile of an album. As that is a good word, right yeah. there. Yeah, what's it gonna take? Once again, has that modern hard rock sound, but has a tad more of that eighties hair metal tinge to it. Some of the background vocals remind me of Extreme a little bit. You know, if it, that kind of uh, kind of sound going on. And it has lyrics alluding to their time in their eight in the eighties. Uh, you know, down at the whiskey cements this album as a love letter to the eighties. Um, again, Saints of Los Angeles carried these themes. Good song, you know, uh, on this album in particular. That that is a good song. Um, Motherfucker of the year ups the aggression a bit, keeps the modern hard rock sound going, but there isn't really anything separating this album from bands like Blackstone Cherry or Hailstorm, you know, apart from Vince Neil's distinctive voice, which I feel as though it kind of blends in with a lot of bands of that era as well. And it's testament to, like you say earlier with Nikki being very switched on as to what's going on in rock music at the time. But I feel like they did the exact same thing 
with this one that they did on New Tattoo, albeit seven years later when the sound of rock had changed again. And it, yeah, I I do completely get what you're saying because it does sound like, it does sound like an affectionate love letter to the 80s, but it also feels so modern it's generic a, a lot of the time uh, like the animal in me is a balladish track you know so far these songs are very solid at, at points but they're not the hair metal crew from the 80s they're a modern hard rock band you know this could honestly be a hailstorm song thrown into like a compilation like if you told me this was hailstorm featuring vince neil I would believe you because it, it doesn't sound like that distinctive 80s Motley Crue. And I, and I know, you know, it's very easy for people to turn around and say, oh, well, bands, bands evolve and things. Right? It's like, yeah, OK, but there is also an element of they definitely paid attention to what was popular on. And there's more than one album to back that up. Yeah. Um, you know, Anything post Doctor Feelgood was an attempt to fit in. Um, Welcome to the Machine brings the brings the pace back up. It's an energetic flurry of rock and roll. I did enjoy listening to this album, but um, I one hundred percent get what you mean, and this is why it's lower down on the list than everything I've put above it. Yeah. Um, yeah, just another psycho, another modern hard rock song. Like the main criticism I have on this album that it is pretty samey. Um, the songs I feel are like units in themselves where I could listen to this and be like, yeah, that was pretty fun. But like as a whole album, I I likely won't listen to this right through again, maybe once or, or twice in the future. But aside from that, Chicks Equals Trouble. Oh my is, God. Yeah. Chicks Equals Trouble, possibly the most shamelessly 80s women song on this record. And like I said, it could almost be a Steel Panther song, just with how on the nose it is. Yeah. This this ain't a love song sounds like it sounds a little less on the nose, but that's saying a lot considering, you know, the lyric is this ain't a love song, this is a fuck song. <laughs> <laughs> you know. And it's it, almost it, it's almost like, yeah. like lyrics that other bands like wrote and went, oh fuck, we can't do that. Molly Crew's <laughs> yeah. like, yeah, we'll t- we'll t- that sounds good. Fuck song, I like that. Yeah, I it it is. It's just such a. I do think that song could have been on Doctor Feelgood that with that feel of it. Maybe with Doctor Feelgood's production, that could have been a song on that album and I probably wouldn't bat an eye mainly down to like the songwriting on that one it's it's, um, it's probably as good as she goes down <laughs> yeah true <laughs> uh white trash circus probably my least favorite on the album it's it's the least memorable to me personally and then the appropriately titled going out swinging like brings the album to a close with its speedy riffing and police chase kind of attitude going on but yeah like you say that this album is it it's like uh it's like a hey here's a record you might like old timer you know yep th- th- this is an album about stuff that we sang about back then <laughs> <laughs> so yeah through th- yeah through the lens of 40 somethings so it, it it can it can come off strange like you know glam is kind of known as as a young young man's game it's it you know with the whole attitudes and stuff it's very it's it's music to listen to on prom night really isn't it like i do enjoy 80s glam metal and i i have had to give myself a little bit of a palate cleanser because I listened to so much glam during my college years that I actually glammed myself out and I need <laughs> and I needed grunge to come back to me to yeah. sober me up a little bit because I just I'd fallen down this rabbit hole 
of everything needs to be glam. And eventually I just got burnout from it because I just started thinking, you know, there's only so many times I can hear a dive bomb and a gated snare before uh, <laughs> before I start to think, wow, I'm only listening to this genre. And, you know, I, I do love this genre. It is one of my favorites. And it's what the beginnings of Eddie Sparks was founded upon. But it really is... I, I digress. The, this it's very young sounding music yeah. for for more mature guys to be playing at this point. So I think that's why a lot of glam bands are legacy acts now because they they don't play much new stuff. People go to a Poison show to hear "Look What the Cat Dragged In," you know. Yeah. You know that kind of era. Yeah, so, I, yeah, um, I, you do. You do have a point because I don't really know how how much people really want to hear new music from a lot of those bands, especially the ones that were really big hair, big pyro kind of bands. Um, yeah, there's not a lot that they could bring to the table with new material. Whereas you do have other bands that get lumped in with those bands. Um, mm. I don't know, like first name that comes to mind is Tesla. Tesla is a band that gets lumped in with yeah. hair bands, but they're absolutely not. And they wrote an album recently that I think is pretty damn good for, you know, old dudes writing that kind of hard rock. So I think Motley yeah. Crue unfortunately falls in that category where it's like they're on that side of the line where you need youth and honest rebelliousness in order to make the the music seem legit and, yeah. and exciting. I, I can't believe it's taken me this long to get to, to this to this point I was going to make. Have you ever seen that video of Motley Crue doing Kickstart My Heart live and Vince oh. is struggling to remember you, the lyric? Are you talking and about Kista Maha? That one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I got a cows. Chubba so, B. Yeah, I can't. Food and food and Chubba B. I, I can't. <laughs> I can't make it through um, the the end concert movie because of really? that. Because the vocals wow. are so awful and also obviously auto tuned that it's just almost like a weird <laughs> tone. Instead of a man's voice, it's just more of a yeah. instead of words. And I I don't know. I, I I don't want to talk shit about the guy because yeah. he's old. I mean, they're in, I think they're all almost sixty now. I think if not, I think yeah. Nikki Six is sixty. Mm. Um, and so I don't. I'm not going to talk shit because not everybody can keep it up the way they used to. And why why would somebody want to stop performing if they love performing? So fine. Yeah. But it is very laughable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah it's like it's easy. vince if vince if you're listening to this love you yeah, my guy you. yeah but um please try to remember the words to kistamaha <laughs> <laughs> all right well on that note let's i guess let's move on to to my number seven go for it uh my number seven is the 1994 self-titled album motley Ooh. crew the only album with john karabi on vocals um, and honestly, I would say at this point in my list, it's, I, I'm, I, I don't have a lot of shit talking. Like I got that out of the mm. way. Cause I do think that this album, especially in hindsight feels honest. It, it feels like an attempt to sort of, to use a more modern term, rebrand yourself. Um, yeah. And I did I did a podcast episode last year where I talked about bands where albums changed their vocalists and kind of changed their sound as well. And that's a good time to do it. If you're going to make a shift in tone, having a different sounding vocalist is a good time to do it. Um, yeah. So John Karabi, first off, he's, he sounds great on this album. He's a great vocalist, arguably Hell a better yeah. vocalist than Vince Neil. Um, so the big question that comes up when I, when I ranked this album, because if this was being ranked in some sort of different ranking, like maybe albums of 94 or something else, I might have better things to say about it. But the thing that comes up over and over again is, 
is this actually Motley Crue? Now in the grand scheme of things where the band has come full circle, come back in the fold with Vince Neil, done several albums with him, and now we're back to Motley Crue being the four dudes that you know, when you listen mm. to this, it's not Motley Crue. It's got some good attitude. It's got some great rock and roll, some great riffs. It's heavy. The production's fucking great. Mr. I mean, Killer. just, I mean, we could do a whole, we should do a top 10 Bob Rock produced albums one time. That sounds pretty good. Hell yeah. So, and this would be on it. So, um, my biggest gripe about this one is that, um, while the performances are really good and I feel like their hearts were in it, it does sound a little bit too hard to, of a band trying to be relevant in 1994. But I also feel that that's honest. I think that's what they wanted to do. I, mm. I feel like a lot of these bands, when people throw the word sellout out there, they're not taking into consideration the fact that these bands probably are friends with these other people making this music that sounds different than theirs. And they're probably listening to and enjoying this music. That's big yeah. like Alice in Chains and Nirvana and what, what have you. And so it's honest to take this music on and co incorporate it into your own. If that is what you were feeling at the time. But um, I, I think the reason why it failed is because it does have that feeling of this is a band trying kind of hard to get away from the hairspray and the fire. Yeah. Just like, just like in that classic interview, did you ever see that classic interview from this album where the, the interviewer on MTV says, are you trying to, to, to escape the hairspray girls in fire? And Nikki six gets all mad and they, they edited the interview yeah. where he's all like, why would you say hairspray girls in fire? And they literally intersperse images of hairspray girls in fire from their videos. And and, then, <laughs> and then at that point, MTV just bailed on Motley Crue and said, fuck you guys. We're not playing yeah. shit. And so uh, it, they were they were trying very hard. But like I said, overall, I do think this album deserved um, a little bit more uh, praise than it got. Um, especially, yeah. especially now listening to it, it's very well done. And, um, I'm going to, just like I said, with Saints of Los Angeles, Hooligans Holiday is a fucking great song. Hooligans Holiday awesome. is a, that is a legit crank that shit up song. If that song comes on, I'm turning the shit up and I'm like, fuck yeah. <laughs> like it's such a great fucking rock and roll song. Um, and then, so yeah, so it's got good shit like that. Some of the slower, more ballad -y stuff, it, it seems a bit too serious. Like, But I think that yeah. that's John Karabi's influence because he was a songwriter on the album. And so I don't fault them for that. Oh, the thing that I would just keep saying over and over again is it doesn't feel like a Motley Crue album. And so in the grand scheme of things, it's hard to rank it higher than where I ranked it. Plus, I'll wrap up my, my summary with this. As much as I think this is a good album, Exposed by Vince Neil is much better. So that <laughs> that I that is a reason why I think these those two albums I'm all like I would rather listen to Exposed than uh, Motley Crue's self titled. So there you go. That's why it's at number seven. I I need to listen to Vince Neil's solo stuff now. The, I come to think of it, j just I've that heard, one because his other yeah. stuff is not it. No, but the, cause he literally did an, a, a fucking rap industrial kind of album after, uh, uh, exposed, <laughs> but exposed literally yeah. just sounds like a lost Motley Crue album. Like it could have been the album that came out after Dr. Feel Good if grunge hadn't happened. Yeah. It's, it, so it's a weird, um, year for it to have come out because I, I know, it's uh I know there's a song on it called You're Invited But Your Friend Can't Come. I love that song. From Encino Man, one of my favorite movies. I, I do I do need to see Encino Man. You have not but seen yeah. Encino Man? I have not seen Encino Man. Homework, dude. Find that movie somewhere Homework. and watch it. <laughs> it is it is I, I it is will. the epitome of a, a, a good time nineteen ninety one comedy that I don't know. It's of its time, and I think it's aged very well because of the fact that it seems like it's from the '90s. And I love yeah. Polly Shore. I don't care what anybody says. Um, I, I I feel guilty that I haven't seen it, and I, I've yeah. I've heard things about it. Yeah, I do it. I should. God damn it, Will. 
All right, all right. So back on. Yeah. So yes, exposed is good, but yes. So so Motley, but I don't like the Motley Crue album as much. So, but we're not talking about Vince Neil's solo. So let's let's move on to your number six. Okay, here here we are at number six, possibly my most controversial placing on this list. All right. Now, I'm ready. You ready? I think so. Number six. Too fast for love. Whoa. Yep. Okay. Okay. And and I've got a few points, and I want to make it very clear. I like this album. Okay. Now this is where this is where we enter the realms of I like this, but I have my I have my gripes. Okay. So I'm just gonna say it. The way that both Vince sounds and is produced on this album makes him sound like he inhaled helium before his vocal takes <laughs> especially on too fast for love <laughs> yeah uh, that like i i know he could do like crazy high notes throughout the 80s but for some reason his voice on this album it could be the fact that it's a very dry record yeah so th- there's not really much processing as far as i'm aware to things maybe some reverb but it's very light you know com- Compared to, compared to the production on, say, something like Girls, 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 or or even Doctor Feelgood, you know, those are heavily produced. You know, this is the rawest album they have ever done. It's it's much punkier and drier than the rest of their work. They're a furious, hungry, and energetic band. There is no denying that. They're still kind of refining their sound at this point, and. I feel as though for me it suffers the same fate as Kill 'Em All does in my in my head because I'm thinking there's Motley Crue albums that from a production point of view will satisfy me more than this album does. And I'm while I'm not a big fan of the album's sound, I can appreciate what is good about the record so i'm i'm gonna go into my track by track all right and kind of and kind of dig myself out of the hole <laughs> i've just i've just dug myself so the album opens with live wire which is a great song you know it's a great opening statement for the band that's like fuck you i'm here dan, da, 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 hello we are motley crew yeah and followed up by come on and dance it's a slow groover. I like it. You know, I love the riff. I love that whole halftime chorus thing. Really, you know, considering the production, it does come off as heavy. Um, I, I know that it's early 80s and it's like 1981. So the production hadn't gotten to a point yet where it was it was favoring that kind of brighter kind of guitar sound. Cause a lot of the, a lot of the seventies guys got their heaviness from being quite fuzzy and be, whereas this is much more of a kind of more pronounced thing. And, you know, coming in at the next track, you know, public enemy number one has a weird kind of syncopated feel at the beginning going into a distinctively happy sounding major key showing off like an early example of that good time party vibe that they had because a lot of the song a lot of the songs on this album have like major sections and as a metal band i know they're i know they're a glam metal band and they pretty much fall on possibly like the most the poppiest spectrum of the whole metal thing or that definitely but even so a lot of these bands still wrote like in minor you know you had the odd one usually ballads but on this album there's a lot of major key um merry go round is is a weird song to me i i honestly don't know how i feel about merry go round is it a ballad is it a rocker it's it's not my favorite 80s motley motley crew song really it shows off mick but for some reason the feel of this one puts me off a little bit i, I don't know what it is it's it's also very repetitive because he you can only yeah. hear him say merry-go-round and round enough yeah to me. he says it like 50 times in the song <laughs> 
one hundred percent. And and again, it's like um, I always call it. If if a song repeats the same thing too many times, I call it um, Angel and the Gambler syndrome. Where <laughs> like, don't you think I could save you? Yes, Blaze, we heard you like fifty hundred times. <laughs> but the um, yeah, it take me to the top. However, is a fucking beast of a song. Those riffs. That ba-dum, 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 pulsing bass in there, the gang vocals, the the everything in this song. This song was made for a big stage production. You know, I love how the chorus and verse could be from completely different songs, but it just works so well yeah. when they go from, they just go into the dun 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 bit, just gets me fucking headbanging every time. I don't even realize I'm doing it. And that's when you know you've written a good riff. Totally. <laughs> um, piece of your action is like a hybrid of the sections that make up "Take Me to the Top." It still manages to be its own entity. It, again, it's a it's a more of a headbanger. The section after the the, ri- the, ri- the main riff in that song always makes me think of Rat. Things that Rat would end up doing. Yeah. It really sounds like a Rat kind of. Yeah. I didn't think about that, but that really that that makes a lot of sense. And that that bit, the section after the solo with the wiggly 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 oh yeah, da-da. I f- that that is almost that's almost like Maiden, you know. Yeah. I, I love that little bit. Um, Starry Eyes starts off with one of the strangest, almost China symbol sounding hi hats I've ever heard <laughs> in a mix. And when I heard it, I was like. What that's some weird EQ on that hi hat, you know, or I I don't know what it is that made it sound that way. It could have been the reverb they were using, but I've never heard a hi hat sound that dark. And like the the bridge section and the solo in Starry Eyes, it almost feels disco in parts. Yeah, like the the combination of the octave parts with the solo, especially combined with Tommy Lee's choice of drum beat like the thing it really evokes that disco kind of feeling and in 1981 I suppose there were like little remnants of that left kicking about not much but to a little extent I uh the title track Too Fast for Love now this is a fun track this is the sound of Motley playing their brand of dangerous glam metal they would continue to develop on their next album, specifically with the glaringly similar 10 Seconds to Love. <laughs> you know, I, I always I always drew parallels between those songs and it's like, hey, you know, we did that da, da, to love kind of thing on the last record. Maybe we can do a better version of that. Or maybe they just had two versions of the songs and, and they and they Shit. liked both. Uh, all, yeah. all I know is that anytime somebody says that song title, 10 Seconds to Love, I'm like, well, what does that even mean? Is it like, yeah. is it get ready, get get your get in position on the bed because there's 10 seconds to go before I start loving you. <laughs> <laughs> See, I always just interpreted it as uh, premature ejaculation. <laughs> oh, shit. That's a good one. It could that's, be. That's, that's, I... on a, that's for a different <laughs> album, though. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, uh, on with the show begins a lot like merry-go-round, starting off with that ballad kind of thing, gradually going into the more rocking kind of thing. It even has it even has that same kind of distorted but plucked kind of dun 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 dun, dun kind of feel. Yeah. That I th- I think a lot of bands would do the same thing, but they do it with like a clean sound, whereas Mick Mars pretty much throughout this album just had distortion on the whole time um and also say, also another major key song yeah it's, it's another major key song uh i'd say this one is appropriately placed on the album uh kind of as if to close out the set but there's one track left it's almost like a simulated encore um and well, then although, although toast- i think that's the original ending is is on yeah with the show which which is what I'll get to okay. with Toast of the Town. <laughs> Toast of the Town is is like the is like the encore. Um, it is worth noting that this song wasn't included on the 1982 Electra version. 
it was on the original yeah. leather records version. Um, also, also I, stick to your guns was on there too. It was. I completely forgot about stick to your guns. Yeah. Oh, but I, th- I, I think both tracks work well as album closes, yeah. which is, which is good for both versions. And like I said, there's a lot of major keys on this album, which they didn't do much later on. Um, but anyway, I liked this album, but it is the least likely for me to listen to from their eighties work pretty much based on the production alone. You know, I, I think there's, I think the songs are great, but uh, I've always, I've always got the little devil on my shoulder saying some of the albums have much better production though. Will and your ears will thank you. But I'm like, well, maybe, maybe I want to listen to live wire. Well, I do you think, know? I do think it's important to point out that it was a very low budget affair. I don't think that they yeah. spent very much money on that album. So I feel like maybe they, they knocked it out pretty quick. Yeah. Um, but just to piggyback, this isn't something I was going to say, but it's a thought that I, I remembered for on with the show for that album closer. I don't know why, but it always gave me a similar vibe to um, if you know the song "Rock and Roll Suicide" by David Bowie, which which wraps up Ziggy yeah. Stardust. For some reason, I I, fa- I there's parts of of that song that just made me think of, Oh, were they going for a Bowie Ziggy stardust? Cause it's a, it's a glam thing. Mm, and so I, yeah. for some reason, even though they're different, they don't sound similar, but for some reason, maybe it's the lyrical content or maybe it's the overall feel of the song. I was like, they were trying to do a, a rock and roll suicide kind of song yeah. at the end of it. I think with a lot of like early glam metal as well, like I've got a book here somewhere called legit called like the big book of hair metal or something. Yeah. And, and it is just a completely chronological, it's literally the Bible of glam. And I, need I to think, get that. So, I, th- I think something that, that isn't stated enough is, is the influence, the seventies UK glam thing, you know, while it was a short lived scene, you know, without, those kind of influences the 80s hair metal scene probably wouldn't have kicked off at all like you, I, I, you might absolutely have had, agree yeah like you may have had like a band like van halen but even then they'd have probably gone down like a, a different route if yeah. that were the case but even then even then the very first van halen album they covered a song by the kinks so it's yeah we're, we're, so when it comes to that that era of rock and roll Everybody is taking from UK yeah. rock bands. So, uh, well, I guess well, well, let's quickly move on to my number six. And I'm going to be quick with this one because we already talked about it. Um, no problem. But my number six is Generation Swine. Wow. And um, like I said before when I was reacting to how you were talking about it, um, this album doesn't feel as forced as you were saying. It feels like a natural reaction to what was going on at the time and and a band trying to incorporate modern sounds and modern production values in with their music. Um, does it does it work all the time? Absolutely not. Um, th- this is uh, the funny thing about Motley Crue is that I love them so much. Um, and, and I would, I'd put them high up on a list of bands that I, that I enjoy listening to, but aside from three of their albums, I have a lot of gripes about every, every, every album they put out. (laughs) (laughs) So that's very interesting to say, but I, I, I think generation swine is very enjoyable and, and complete opposite from you find myself as a great opening song. I think. Um, but yeah. I, I also like it when bands do things that don't necessarily fit in with where you would think they would be going. Um, and so that's why, you know, Afraid is a, just a great pop song and they, you know, it's just them playing a fucking great pop song. And the, the thing that I think is cool about this album is that sure, Vince Neil came back on board, but they didn't immediately turn coat and start trying to go glam metal again. There's a little bit of the vibe that the the self-titled album had on this one also. And so mm. it, it feels like sort of a natural progression. And so it doesn't bother me that much, but also this is the last album when I would say that I think Vince Neil sounded relatively good as a vocalist. I think yeah. after this one, 
I have a lot of gripes about his performances. And so to me, this just sounds like 1997 Motley Crue. Um, and maybe it's with hindsight because, because music like what they did on Generation Swine didn't get done over and over and over again. There, there hasn't been a shitload of bands continuing to do this sort of hard rock mixed with industrial sounds mixed with, you know, whatever else. And so because yeah. of that, it's almost made this period of music very endearing or, or giving it an endearing quality because I'm like, Oh, I remember that. I remember when bands were doing, they were taking on technology. Like it's the nineties. Yeah. We, we got the internet now, you know, and now we're, we're incorporating, you know, modern elements. And so, um, even though there's, there are some weak tracks, um, it really, there are some cool spots on it. Um, you, you talked about glitter. Glitter has like a really fucking weird guitar solo on it. And, mm. and, it, it's one of those things where anytime a song makes me go, what, what the fuck is that sound? What is that? And it doesn't sound like what I was expecting. It just makes it that much more enjoyable. Um, and then like, I don't know, the title track I think is pretty fucking cool. Um, really like, I think the only thing that I can say is that even, even though a lot of these attempts at incorporating modern and popular sounds doesn't always work. It doesn't sound like they're phoning it in. It sounds like they got back together. They had a plan. They were rejuvenated. They, they mm -hmm. were, it's almost seems like they all were on the same page again in making an album. Yeah. And, um, it's, yeah, it's just fun to listen to, but I will agree with you that shout at the devil. 97 is fucking awful. Um, I don't know why need to they happen. put it on there. <laughs> um, and it's just one of those things where if, if it's a classic song already, you don't need to redo it because everyone's already sell, everyone has already told you it's good. So, yeah. but also I don't know if that was just some sort of one-off thing they did for fun and then decided to throw it on the album. I don't really know what the intent was because obviously it's at the end of the album. So it's almost like a album's over. Here's another thing that yeah. we fucked around with. So overall, the big thing, the big takeaway with Generation Swine is it, it's a good time. And that's kind of what you want with Motley Crue. Uh, and so, yeah, yeah, number number six. All right. So on that note, we, we're well over an hour now with still many albums to go. We still have our five through one to get through. Um, I think let's let's half this shit up. I think that uh, uh, let's let's leave it here for now for part one of our Motley Crue cranked and ranked episode. And um, we'll pick this up in a week uh, with five through one, Le leave you guys wanting more. Uh, so yeah. So, so yeah, thank you for listening to part one of the Motley Crue cranked and ranked. We will be back next week with the other half. Uh, Eddie, you have any parting words for this part one episode? Uh, I'll, I'll just say my catchphrase. Uh, Later, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. All right. See you guys next time.